everybody. My name is Jeff Bull, Manager of Developer Advocacy. Hi everyone, I'm David Owen, CEO of Every Angle. David, it's great to have you here today. Um, it, this is our last day here at Cisco Live Amsterdam, which has been a blast. Uh, it's been my first time overseas, so getting acclimated to traveling and you know being in a new city, it's been a lot of fun. Um, and I, something I wanted to come to you about is your your organization works a lot with integrations with the Meraki specifically and, and the verticals that you primarily focus on. Um, and as we were talking in the pre-show a little bit, I find it really interesting how we can use, how customers and partners can leverage technologies like Meraki's MV, the cameras, and not just we tend to think of cameras and things like that for security purposes, like a purely security, someone trying to break into my house. Or, and yes, of course that exists. But through, and especially here in the DevNet zone, we're always talking about integrations, APIs, developer tools to do more with the things we already have. And so I'd really love to give you an opportunity to talk a bit more about what Avery Engel does and some of the technologies you develop using Meraki because I find them extremely interesting how you can gain this level of analytics for people and make real business decisions based off of that. It's a fascinating topic, right? So much so, that's why I started a company doing it. So I, I'm bound to be interested in it. I think one of the interesting things there, when you called it around, you know, everyone's aware of cameras, you go into retail, hospitality, any industry, right? But you're right, most people think of cameras as CCTV. And particularly mindful of the DevNet audience that we have, what's a really interesting concept to kind of, you know, roll your head around is the idea of camera as a sensor to codify the visual environment, right? taking images and video and codifying that so that we can then actually apply various different machine learning tools to help drive decision intelligence. It's around doing things differently at scale that just weren't possible before. You know, and, what's, and there's probably a ton word on that, but what, something you just made me think about is specifically from a automation perspective, you're almost, you're automating away the human element to a degree in that you don't necessarily, people think, like you said, CCTV, you think there's a person in a room watching a thing to see what happens and then they make a decision based off of that. And what you're really opening the door for is we can let the technology handle a lot of those repetitive decisions when we have a series of these are all the data points we want to be able to look for. A, a uh, application can monitor for that and make some of those decisions so then the human can do a, make a more creative and interesting decision later on. I mean, ab absolutely. And just to like, to kind of, everyone loves some stats, right? Okay, so you throw some fun facts on that. So there is over one billion, one billion CCTV devices deployed in the world today, and that number is gonna more than double in the next 24 months, okay? So it's, it's, it's crazy, the growth rates there. And yet, okay, less than 0.1 of 1% of all of the video that's ever recorded on those cameras is ever reviewed by a human being. Really? Yeah, so you've got this huge ocean of data that's being captured, and yet only a fraction of it is ever being reviewed. And that's not because there isn't value, it's not because there isn't insight to be gleaned from that. The challenge is it cannot be done at scale. And, and one, of the, one of the, I guess, themes that you know, I'm seeing, we were at NRF in New York uh, in, in January, now in Amsterdam, speaking with retailers, anywhere in the service industry, there is just this pervasive systemic shortage of staff. And, and the operational pressures that that places uh, on all of these different um, industries is huge. And, and you take your case in point, even just look at physical security. Uh, you've got shrink and fraud and, 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 uh, and theft at checkout increasing, around five, six percent per year. It's a hundred billion dollar problem in the US, 97 billion dollar problem here in EMEA, and yet, the average number of people who are in a loss prevention team who are, who are charged with investigating these issues, 70% of those are either staying static or reducing in size. So to your point, the opportunity that we have here is can we actually automate tasks to help the human being perform as though they were two or three or four of themselves because that's the only way that we close the gap in this labor shortage. Yeah, absolutely. It is. You're, you're tugging on a through line that has been coming up in multiple conversations, which is this idea that, um, the, speaking of the classic network engineer as just a construct for a moment, you know, there's, there has been a, re a hesitancy in many cases, like, well, I don't want, if I automate too much, I'll automate myself out of a job. And my thought has always been that if your value is typing commands or finger ops, as one of our distinguished engineers likes to say, if, you're, if that is your, the value you think you bring, you're not that valuable. Yeah. The value you bring as a person is making, is taking all this information that you have in your brain and making contextual and creative decisions and solving real problems using that. So why not automate away the things that 
take you away from spending time doing that. Yeah. And so a lot of what you're describing is being able to take all this data, that's these sets of data, and have it be analyzed so a person can look at the results and then make a decision saying, here's how we want to deal with these trends, here's, here's what things we want to handle with that. Um, so one of, the, one of the applications I saw, I noticed something called footfall. I'd love to learn a little bit more about that because I've seen some of that in retail, and I thought it'd be kind of interesting to talk through what a customer or partner can do with something like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and it fits into, there's, you know, it's good to clarify, right? There's three main industries that we play in. So retail, hospitality, and, and gas stations, or automotive fuel retail, if you want to give it its full title, right? And within those three different industries, there's three key areas that we help with. As you mentioned, footfall, which falls under this idea of customer insights, helping understand more around how people are using spaces and places. The third, the second area is around loss prevention, so checkout fraud and theft and so on. And then the third, which is a new product launch for us, which is around risk and compliance. And that's really cool, and we're, I know we'll get to that in a minute. So on the customer insights uh, part, honestly, the gap that we were trying to address there was, think around an online retailer. Mm -hmm. and think about how much they know from homepage to checkout at a code level around their shoppers. They, they know so much, and particularly if you sign in with a social profile, they know so much, they can profile. Mm -hmm. Think around entering into a physical store, okay? If you don't buy anything, you leave no digital footprint. Less than 40% of people who enter a space in retail, hospitality, leave any digital footprint. So they're invisible. So the question then is, how can you actually go and understand more about these individuals that are coming in? And getting back to your point around value, okay? It's not just around counting people, it's not producing the data point, it's using that to help understand, are your marketing dollars driving the right behaviors? Being able to split test, and this is one of the, one of the concepts I love, thinking of the store by code, okay? So if you codify that visual environment, you then use cameras to turn that store into a split testing platform. That is fantastic. It's, it, brings up, it brings up things I've heard about in marketing and in web testing, where you do A-B type testing. In exactly. marketing, that's a very yeah. common thing. For web development and things like that, A-B testing is, when you're releasing code, A-B testing is a great thing to do. You test some amount of your deployment here with this audience and some out here, and see what, what differences exist, you can decide make decisions based off of that. So what you're describing sounds a lot like almost A-B style testing, but in a yep. retail environment. So yep. certain digital signage over here, certain you know in, in caps over here, and then make a decision, where are people going by and large? Are they being drawn to this? That's fascinating. And if you think about that, like from an opportunity, so from a development standpoint or developer standpoint, one of the, it's a model I love, we look at it when we're building any new uh, product proposition or value proposition, the Kano model, and we look at well, what are the must-haves that proposition has to deliver, what are the performance factors, and what are the delighters. And to your point around automation and saying, well, if you're a developer, you know, and being fearful of automation because maybe that kind of, you know, takes you out of a paycheck, right? Well, actually, if you look at must-haves and you look at performance factors, th that's, that's a quantitative outcome. So where automation makes sense is where we're talking around doing more of the same. But when you produce a data point that, a that enables you to contextualize other telemetry data, there is an opportunity to do something qualitatively different. And the encouragement, and, and, and what I would say to any one of our developer team is, if you are not always thinking about how you're actually going to drive forward innovation to do something that is qualitatively different at that delighter level, okay, then you are missing a trick because that's how we bring true value to the customer. Completely agree. Now, we'd be reticent if we didn't come back to the fact yes. that you are dropping something new and I yes. thought that'd be really interesting to dive into, so please. Excellent, thank you. Yes, so it's, uh, it's a new product launch. Uh, it's exclusive with Cisco. We only work with Cisco. We only sell through the Cisco channel, so it's all around partnership with a capital P. And the new product that we have, it's called Rest Assure. And what it does is it helps hospitality and retailers who obviously employ shift-based workers to defend themselves against labor code and labor code compliance class oh. action lawsuits. Uh, this is a phenomenal problem and one I didn't even know existed six months ago, but we had a customer approach us and they said, look, we're fighting a multi-million dollar class action lawsuit. The only way that we can defend ourselves against that at the moment is to retain video footage for five years, 24-7 huge on-premise storage cost, huge energy consumption. So what we've done is, and we've released it just at NRF just three weeks ago, uh, we have a new product, as said, called RestAssure, and it delivers hyper-efficient, long-term CCTV video recording and archiving for Meraki cameras with intelligent retrieval. So we imprint metadata on the video as we record it, and then the retailer or hospitality operator is able to go in and say, hey, can I see that this particular employee was actually working on that day? 
Did they get a rest break? Did they get a lunch break? And we're able to bring this information back and help them fend off that class action lawsuit. Interesting. So that that actually brings to mind a lot of uh, sort of like the legal e-discovery sort of industry yes. where they're, they have to do that anyway. And for, for folks that don't know, that is a pretty common thing in any any business. Um, and then legal specifically, e-discovery is a huge deal where being able to go back and pull digital documents and digital footprints for the purposes of doing discovery in a lawsuit. This sounds like it's a really good companion to that to help not just protect the business, but to make sure that they can actually... Um, bring that data to bear when the time comes. Absolutely, and, and, and what's been really interesting is you, know, you, you design a product to solve a particular problem, and then you get a reaction from the marketplace saying, hey, could we also use that to solve this problem or that problem, things you haven't even thought about. And one of the areas that, that's just come up here really with uh, some conversations we've had in Amsterdam is the growth, unfortunately, in attacks on frontline hospitality and retail staff. Yeah. It's also happening in healthcare as well. And one of the most commonly used countermeasures to try and prosecute the individuals, unfortunately, who are taking these, these uh, involved in these incidents is CCTV video footage. Yet, that normally, the retention period, caps out at 45, 46 days. Mm -hmm. So now we have this whole other range of industries saying, can we use that rest assured product to help deal with that challenge? And one of the things, one customer came to us and, and working with them, we were able to identify the sustainability benefit of this. Because what we're doing is, with this hyper-efficient storage, we're actually eliminating over a million kilowatt hours per site. Um, over a five-year period, mm -hmm. that's the same thing as taking 34 passenger vehicles off the road in terms of carbon that's emissions. A substantial savings. It, which is when you scale that, it's huge. Yeah, and I mean, as anybody who's been attending Cisco Live in person this week, it probably would know in general if you follow Cisco at all is sustainability broadly, but also in the specific is a huge deal for Cisco. We have, as an organization, we're working on heavily. We have an entire zone working heavily to reduce the footprint of our packaging and things of that nature. How much, you know, we actually know what people would probably notice. There's very, basically no swag at Cisco Live. Because there's no like, carpet here. There's no, so there's there's no, no carpet there's, on there the floor. There is no carpet. And this is done intentionally because yeah. we're trying to reduce it. So to hear that you're able to also find other ways to help businesses meet their sustainability goals while also solving for real problems they have, that's a, that's a big deal. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it's been fantastic having you here. Um, what can we, uh, where can people find more about the work that your company does and these products and how to get in touch with you? Yeah, so some really easy ways to do that. Firstly, if you go to the Meraki ecosystem marketplace, okay, you will find us listed there along with a range of other ecosystem partners and definitely something I'd, uh, I'd encourage everyone to check out. We're also part of the new Cisco CoCell program mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, really for us, the audiences that we're looking to try and activate are obviously end customers, also Cisco reseller partners and the Cisco sales and engineering community. So you'll find us on DevNet, you'll find us on Sales Connect, you'll find us on Meraki Marketplace. Excellent. You will find us pretty much everywhere. I, I'm, I'm told I will go to the opening of an envelope, right, <laughs> if I can promote every angle. So you'll see us there. Fantastic. And uh, yep, yeah, um, we'd love to go and, uh, and chat with anyone who has a project where we think we might be able to make a difference. Most excellent. Well, David, thank you again for being here. Really Pleasure. appreciate it. Thanks everyone for watching. You can find all the information about the DevNet Zone and Cisco Live at developer.cisco.com slash Cisco Live. Thank you.